other connections on there is with Bust and Loose with Chuck Brown and Gogo, which there's I'm from Maryland. I love Gogo, but the uh, Bust and Loose with Chuck Brown and Soul Searchers and everything. But there's so much interplay between rap and Gogo, especially in the in the uh, mid to late 80s up into the early 90s. Thanks in part to Curtis Blow, of course, as you know. But um, for you guys on Bustin' Loose on Davey's Ride, why did either you or Davey really want to use that record and redo it? Uh, again, that was a park jam breakbeat that we used when we play, we performed in the parks and um, at the parties. That was one of the records that Davey would play and Davey would scratch and me and Cool T and Butterfly, we would rap over that beat. Um, that was, again, that whole album, Davey's Ride, everything you hear you scratching is everything that you would hear if you came to see us in the park in the 70s. I mean, to the T. So, um, you know, we loved Bustin' Loose when we used to perform that in the park. So, Davey said, yo, let's do it on wax. I'm like, bet, let's do it, you know? So, yeah, now that, that was incredible. I love it. Um, and then uh, you, you've got your Afro shirt on. So I wanted to talk about the Afros because that was the, <clears throat> again, on the outside, looking in the next major, major thing, run the MC's pause. And, and then with the Afros. So Hollywood Shuffle is actually my favorite movie. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and sadly, most of what's in that movie is still applicable today and still goes on, I would argue, in a lot of Hollywood and in our society. So what was it about Hollywood Shuffle? Uh, I always heard it was you and Jay or different people, but what was, what genesis was Hollywood Shuffle to lead into the Afros? Well, the funny thing about the Afros is at first it wasn't going to be called the Afros. We were going to be called the Untouchables. So when you listen to the album, the Afros, and you listen to uh, Cause and Destruction, and straight from the P now, those were the first two records we recorded, and those two songs was we were going to be the Untouchables. Along the way, of recording that, we used to always listen to old, you know, seventies, seventies um, music. We used to always look at old Dolomite films, Superfly, The Mac, all those films, and. And then along comes Hollywood Shuffle, and we love that as well. So the idea of actually wearing the Afro was all of it in one. Everything. It wasn't just the shuffle. The voice of the Afro, yeah, baby, you know what I mean? Do it. That we got from the Hollywood Shuffle. You know what I'm saying? And the name Afros is also something that we decided to do for watching, you know, Hollywood Shuffle, the name. But as far as wearing the Afro itself and the whole concept of it, it was everything that we enjoyed about people with the Afros in that entire era. Okay. Because everybody should rewatch Hollywood Shuffle if they haven't seen it, but Bobby Taylor's the main character. And then he gets, he's trying to become an actor and has these problems. And then right. He finally thinks he's going to get his big role, and then it's uh, Jimmy is the character, and he's the leader of the Afros. Right. Very stereotypical, step and fetch it, shucking and jiving. Very funny. Very funny. Yeah, and it's a, <clears throat> it's very funny, but it's also a, a brilliant satire to me on, you know, how people, the type of roles that were happening, which then directly or indirectly would lead to a song like Burn Hollywood Burn. Uh, that yeah. That came out a little around the same time as the Afros, ironically. Um, exactly. And the funny thing, I didn't know that those were the first two songs from Kicking Afrolistics you guys recorded because I did always wonder sequencing wise toward the end of the album, it got more, way more serious um, and more political with like Cause and Destruction with the Malcolm X speech at the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause I always was like, wait a minute, the first half of this album is like funny and it's more lighthearted and, you know, we're going to take away your worries. And then you got Malcolm X speeches, which kind of do the opposite. So right. why did you guys decide to keep the, 
the causing destructions on there when you did have like better luck next time or feel it or you know the other well you know back then you know um when you recorded a song more than likely you kept that song um due to budgets and um you know getting in the studio and recording them so it was just like okay we recorded all these songs we have to put we have to put all these songs on the album because the label was saying we have to put all these songs on the album you know back then labels didn't want you to waste no records you know they, they want to know everything you recorded and they want to put it all out um so that was the senses of it okay we we recorded these songs. We still like these songs. Do we put still put these songs on the record? And everyone just said, "Yeah, let's just put it on and put it towards the end. That way, they enjoy the whole Afro thing. And then coming towards the end, you get a little different feel. And then by the time the next record will come around, you can balance the act. You know? Okay. Yeah. Interesting, because. You know, thinking back to it, uh, John Witherspoon, rest in peace, of course. But when he had the hoe cake thing in in the movie, yeah, hoe cake for my hoes, yeah. Hoes gotta eat too, man. That's what they yeah, say. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite records on the album, hoe cakes. So, yeah. how, <clears throat> how did you guys find uh, on that record and some of the other cooling with the froze, some of the songs that were more comedic? What did you guys? Or how did you in particular find that tapping into more of the comedy side or lighthearted stuff was different than stuff you had done to that point? Um, you know, because we were always joking around. We were even when we were serious, um, when you see us on stage when we're serious, run DMC and all that, you know, backstage we were always jokesters. All of us was jokesters, you know, we were always cracking jokes, you know what I mean? So basically we just took our fun side and threw it into the Afros because people had not seen that part. And then, you know, the, the Afros, when we came out, we had everybody wearing Afros. Everybody from Ice Cube to Flavor Flay to Big Daddy Kane. Everybody was wearing Afros at the time. The entire Hollis Avenue, the whole Hollis crew. I always say the Afros is the Hollis crew in disguise because the whole Hollis crew would have on Afros at the party, you know? So if something jumped off, only thing you can remember, the guy had an Afro on. You, you, I mean, you look in the crowd, there's about 40 of us with Afros on, you know? So the Afro is the Hollis crew in disguise, but we just decided to have some fun with it because, you know, Hollywood Shuffle was fun. It wasn't violent. So we said, we gotta have some fun with this and make it a, you know, back then it was cool to do stuff like that, you know, in hip hop. We had Digital Underground with Humpty Hump. So it was really cool to do that kind of stuff to come up with, with uh, concepts and ideas like that. Yeah, and then on the Feel It video, they had so many cameos. I think one of my favorites was Flavor Flav in the pool coming out and everything. So, yeah. and, and back to the thing about being fun, um, this was, of course, around a time in 1990 <clears throat> with 89, 90, Rap was starting to get more hardcore, gangster raps coming in, all these different things. But it did seem like the, like you said, digital underground, Afros, different things really resonated with people. So what happened or why do you think the fun or the, that balance, Bismarcky, different things, we lost some of that, at least on the, the platinum levels. You know, it was still happening, still happens today, but it's not viewed at the same top tier at least exposure-wise or sales-wise, even if it's creatively still as good? Why do you think that changed? Man, music and fans just change, you know? Um, I don't think you can put your finger on one particular thing. Um, you know, it shifts back and forth. You know, it may be a happy time, then it may be a serious time, and it just goes back and forth. And then, you know, the, the radio, especially in that era, controlled so much of what the people listened to and what the people want to hear. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't um, the internet. So it was all radio controlled pretty much to know if your record's going to be big 
and program directors choose however they wanted the music to shift to. You know, if they play a whack record and you hear it 20 times a day and you listen to the radio, you find yourself singing this whack record because you listening to the radio and they say, you know, you thinking this whack record is a good record because you keep hearing it. You're starting to like it now, you know? When you heard it the first five, six, seven times, you're like, oh, what is this? You know, so that's what I, you know, that's one of the main things is that back then radio was definitely in control of what was big and what wasn't, or else you would just be underground. Okay. <laughs> and uh, also on Kicking Aphrolistics, the smoking record I really liked, uh, and that one had the same kind of like uh, the beat or the drums were very similar, if not identical to Raw by Big Daddy Kane. So what, what made you guys drawn to that on that record? You know, what's so crazy is that the Afro album itself, including that record, most of those beats and stuff came from me going into my sister's crates and bringing all her records to the studio and we're listening to, you know, beats and, and, and horns and all kinds of sounds and stuff and going through her records. So it's just a matter of us all just sitting down, even though, you know, I don't get credit as a producer on it. A lot of those records came from my crates. Um, and uh, J and Dave, Davey D just uh, put it together and made it sound like it needed to sound. You know, the brilliance that those guys are. And we all just combined together and just and just did it, man. It was just spontaneous stuff. It wasn't like it was planned. You know, we everything we were doing was spontaneous. We go to the studio, spontaneous. We didn't go in there with the whole plan. Okay, let's do the smoking record with these drums like this. It was just like, let's go to the studio. We'll be there at five o'clock. I'm gonna bring some records. We're gonna listen and listen and listen. And we're gonna find something that's dope and we're gonna loop it. And then we're gonna come up with the song. No plan, just do it, you know, so. So that being said, what <laughs> what uh led to the Afros being a one-off? Why didn't you guys do another record? We actually, did another record and we got probably about seven, eight songs done. And then uh, my man Cool T got into some um, police trouble, which delayed us finishing the record. And then um, after that, uh, I wound up going on tour with the Beastie Boys. Okay. And that was that. You know, I'm going to tour with those guys, and that took a long time. But we actually, I still have those songs that we recorded, and they're still pretty good. I think it's about eight songs that we got done. I can imagine. Yeah. So before we get to Beastie Boys, I was also interested because if you really started rapping or making stuff before Rapper's Delight, so before 79, 78-ish, and now we're in 1990, at this point, did you think like, uh, I've been with Davy D, I've been in Hollis Crew, I've been with Run MC, I've been in the Afros. Did you think like, did you understand like this was going to be your career at that point? Because it had been more than a decade already. How were you looking at what was happening in your life? Like, did you were like, man, I'm good. Like, this is it. Yeah, I would probably say, yeah, definitely. I was like, yo, this is, this is how I'm going to get rich. This is how, this is for me, not the streets. Because at that time, I'm still, you know, I would probably say during the Raising Hell tour, right after the Raising Hell tour was the Together Forever tour, which was Davey D, Beastie Boys, and Run DMC. Now, I'm on stage with all three acts, okay? I'm rapping for Davey D, and then we get behind the turntables and do the whole uh, cypher thing with the two DJs going in a circle. You know, we was the first ones to do that. So we, I'm rapping on stage with him, then I'm doing that routine with him. I get off stage, go straight to the Beastie Boys uh, dressing room. We sit down, we do this, write the set this out. Okay, I go back on stage, do the intro, bring the Beastie Boys out. I'm DJing for these guys. Now, I go backstage, change my clothes again, put on my hat, my leather vest, my, my leather uh, blazer, go back out with Run DMC, stand on the stage, you know, doing this, boom, walking back and forth. 
when I did that for a whole tour, I was like, yo, this has got to be my job. <laughs> you know, like, this is it. This is how I'm going to get, you know, make a living. Yeah. And that was, that would have been, what, 88, 89-ish? Yeah, yeah Together Ever Tour was right after the uh, Rage and Hell Tour. I went on the Rage and Hell Tour, then I did the License the Ill Tour. And then the Together Forever tour. So Together Forever tour was uh, 87, 88. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get, I've, I've done so much, I gotta think, gotta think it out. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.